And uh, let me associate myself uh, with the remarks of Mr. Gallagher um, wholeheartedly. Uh, it's one of the most frustrating things about this entire experience is watching my colleagues blatantly lie when signing a piece of paper. And we all know it's true. We all know it. And we see it every day, but we just kind of countenance it and say, oh, go, yeah, go to a fundraiser, good for you. Or, or one story was voting from a, somebody who's out on an interview in a car in the parking lot while there's somebody who's proxy voting for him in here. I mean, and, and again, both sides of the aisle. Let me be perfectly clear, both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, look, we talked about a number of things, and, and my name was invoked earlier. I'll only uh, respond to it briefly about the institution being broken, and the majority leader has referenced this. Otherwise, I wouldn't go down this road too much because this is about proxy. But the institution is broken, um, and a lot is made of so-called procedural votes, and they're somehow delaying the institution or causing harm. I mean, well, keep in mind that there are limited tools that you have when you're in the minority, but in particularly when you're not a chairman, when you're particularly not on a rules committee, or particularly not on, you're not the majority leader, right? So there are limited rules you have. And so last week, for example, when I'm sitting with my staff watching a vote being called uh, for a voice vote for basically $16 billion worth of continuing resolution that I didn't bless, and which most people knew in my party, and generally speaking, it's not like I'm shy about it, that that's not something I would agree to by voice vote. Uh, yeah, I was frustrated that our rights weren't protected and that we didn't have a roll call vote on that. So what did I do? I did force two more procedural votes. Why? Because that's about all I got in my arsenal. I went down and talked to Keith on the floor. I said, Keith, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, you guys are trying to get to Philadelphia. I ended up withdrawing the last one out of uh, some sort of deference. But we have limited tools in our arsenal to say protect our rights. Represent. We're talking about the institution. We're talking about disenfranchising our voters. What is the ultimate disenfranchisement of voters? The lack of any power of any one member of Congress because it's all been handed over to a handful, a handful of people and the majority of the minority in the leadership offices and or in the Rules Committee to make decisions about what we vote on. We get a 2,700 page bill at two o'clock in the morning and the vote on the rule the next morning. 2,700 pages with 5,000 earmarks and $10 billion, $100 billion of increased spending massive complex pieces of language and 2,700 bills my staff is pouring over in the middle of the night just trying to figure out what we're even looking at, right? But that's no way to do business. So we're going to talk about the institution being broken. Let's start there. Um, you know, and I, I heard the majority leader said, we're at war. Now, he kind of twist, twist, tweaked that a little bit after he said we're at war about standing with the people in Ukraine and so forth. We haven't declared war. That's a constitutional requirement. We have not declared war. One of the best conversations I've had in this building was a building downstairs, two floors down, two years ago, with three Democrats, three Republicans, and uh, well, I might as well say Justin, because I was going to say an independent, because he was the only independent, talking about the authorizations of the use of military force. 20 years in to authorizations of the use of military force. And that conversation over a beer in person resulted in a joint op-ed among the seven of us raising questions about 20-year authorizations of the use of military force. But, but, I, but I, I think that's a really important thing we just saw here talking about this body. We're at war. That's a very big statement. That's a debatable statement, one we ought to be debating. Uh, we talk about um, you know, uh, being productive, and there's some debate about the productivity. I would argue productivity for leadership and, and the Rules Committee, and I do want to appreciate the chairman having this ability for us to come speak. It's, it's important, and I, I genuinely thank you for it. But productivity by whom? Pro productivity by a handful is not the people's house. And here we sit and, and we talk about you know, whether this proxy policy is further breaking the institution. Now, I heard that we're extremely polarized. Well. I mean, when the Secretary of Treasury and the Vice President duel, maybe we'll be as polarized as sometimes in our past. Yes, we're polarized. We've had a lot of differences over our, in our history. But it, in this point here with Mr. Gallagher about the fraudulent certification, I do agree that that is disenfranchising and that it is causing distrust in the institution. But, you know, one of the best things that I've been able to do in here is work with uh, uh, my friend Dean Phillips on the PPP Flexibility Act. Again, Backbencher, Freedom Caucus, conservative, 
Dean Phillips were able to get something done on a bipartisan basis in the middle of COVID. But we did that because we were able to get to know each other and sit down and have that beer and sit down to know each other. We break down the human interactions when we blow up the whole point of us coming together as Congress, as somebody talked about earlier, the definition of Congress is us coming together and representing the people. The Constitution, um, and, and sorry, I had to look at notes because we've been here for so long, but the, the fact is we all take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. We do. And I believe that we all, therefore, have an obligation to carefully examine the merits of the constitutional question raised by proxy voting. It is a legitimate constitutional question. We haven't had any long, significant hearings on it. I'm sure my friend from Maryland would love to have in-depth conversations about this. I suspect we disagree on this point. Uh, but at least we ought to have that in-depth debate about the core constitutional question. And maybe the speech and debate clause uh, protects uh, what I believe is unconstitutional proxy voting. Obviously, the Supreme Court denied cert, deferring to essentially us, right? They kind of, they punt, essentially. So here we are, and there's a question. I think we have an obligation to defend the Constitution. It is my perspective that it is, in fact, unconstitutional for us to engage in proxy voting. I, I think that the Constitution is pretty clear on it. I think if you read the text of the Constitution, words like meeting, assemble, attendance, present, absent, recess, sitting, seat, it clearly requires a member of Congress to be actually present in the House or the Senate chamber. I understand technology has changed. Well, then let's amend the Constitution. Let's have a debate about it. But I believe the Constitution clearly uh, believe that we should be, uh, or, or articulate that we should be present. Uh, quorum requirements, same thing. The majority of each shall constitute a quorum and uh, blah, 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 may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members. Um, if you go and look at the text and the history and the understanding of what quorum is, presence matters. The yeas and nays requirement, right? When you get down to the desire of one-fifth of those present be entered in the journal, it was contemplating presence. And I understand there could be some debates about what presence means and whether you can establish presence in a different form. I don't believe that is what we agreed to in the Constitution when we were establishing these things. Non-delegation principle. We the people. Right? Reformed on we the people. All the legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. I understand we can set our rules. I understand that we can come up with ways to represent we the people differently. But the contemplation is that we're not delegating our vote to another member. When we talk about remote voting, we can have that debate. But this changes the entire point. We have last minute changes on the floor. And we've got these rules in place that says, well, your staffer has to tell you the specific vote on that vote. I don't know how it works because I've never proxy voted. But I know there's some rules in place to try to protect, but you're changing the nature of the institution when you hand your voting card off to somebody else. And that's effectively what we're doing. Um, I could go a little bit more into that. And I only address the question on the constitutional issues uh, raised about certain members being pulled off of the, of the litigation. And people have talked about that. And so ultimately it was... It was uh, the minority leader and myself on the, on the litigation in the end after having more members on it at the beginning. Uh, and in part, that was just to clarify and simplify who was on the case. And we all know the facts, we've seen the stuff, that there were some members that had been on the original litigation that ultimately proxy voted. Now I'd say, well, why is that? I wouldn't have, with all due respect to my Republican colleagues who were on the litigation and pulled off. I think that was wrong. But, but the flip side is, is the pressure Okay, what is done when we change the institution? Let me give you an example of a vote. I was sitting in Fredericksburg, Virginia, waiting while we were going through all of the transportation votes last fall. And we were debating. Remember every Friday we would have these ridiculous sit and wait sessions, wondering when the heck we were going to vote? And it was Friday afternoon. I'd committed months prior to speak at the University of Virginia, my alma mater. And I was supposed to be there. And they put out all the advertising, and it was a big thing, and I'd committed to do it. So I'm sitting in Fredericksburg, Virginia at a Starbucks. Because I was just having to figure out, am I going to Charlottesville or am I going back to D.C.? Waiting for the powers that be to tell me when we were going to vote on a bill. I knew I would vote no on, but the vote might be close. But I'm not going to hand over my vote to someone else. And Keith knew this on the floor. And I said, Keith, well, can you let me know as soon as possible? The leadership team knew it. And they were trying to, hey, well, we might need you here for the vote. And my point is just... I had a whole lot of proxy voting members who didn't give a crap about where they were that day because they'd hand off their vote to someone else. There was immense pressure on a lot of members to say, well, 
You know, we're doing this, this tug of war about how we're going to run the place. And it makes it a lot easier to force votes at Friday night at whatever without having any advance notice if half the damn body is voting by proxy. So I'm sitting at a Starbucks and finally Keith gave me the green light. We're voting on some random bill that wasn't the actual transportation bill. And I was like, fine, I'll skip it. My, my, my constituents will forgive me for knowing that I would have voted no on whatever that ridiculous bill was that we voted on that night. So that's the question. And I would say, I know I want to move on to other colleagues, but um, I just want to offer one more thought here is that what we do here is important. But I think sometimes we have a heightened sense of our own importance. There's 435 of us. There's 535 if you count the Senate. At the end of the day, uh, this country is going to plot along, and we're all going to come and go, and we're all going to be pushing up daisies soon enough. We're just members of Congress. And there's 330 million Americans. And we act like, oh, my gosh, this is the most important thing, and we got to be here all day long. Put, a, put your vote in the record how you would have voted. And if it was that important of a vote, then give up whatever that thing is, sacrifice for the good of the country, and get your butt to Washington and vote. I mean, Ron Wright traveled across the country in the last weeks of his life, ravages of cancer, because he knew he couldn't get on the airplane, and it was brutal for him. But he got in a car and drove across the country. And I, I just think when we think about what we're doing here, my son's back here, and clearly you know, enthralled with everything we're talking about. <laughs> but my son's back here. Do you know how many things I miss? I miss them all the time. I mean, I heard the testimony earlier about, you know, giving birth and having family members. How many things have you sacrificed? Right? But, but I do it for him. So when I miss the baseball game, when I miss school, when I miss the event, I'm doing it for him. I'm doing it for my daughter. I'm doing it for my wife. When my wife is sitting at home dealing with the stuff she's dealing with, when the freezer is freezing and the freeze come in Texas, and the hot water heater's not working, and I'm here, right? Those things are all hard. But it's our job. It's our obligation. And if you can't do it, think about not running again. Think about resigning. Thinking about giving it to someone else. There are 750,000 people in Texas 21. I ain't that important. I'm just not. I mean, at the end of the day, our job is what's important. And I believe that the Constitution is strengthened. Our republic is stronger if we're here in person and we're following the constitutional order. And if we want to change that, we should debate on an amendment and we should vote on it. And with that, I'll yield back.